Welcome to Dare to Innovate. My name is Andrew Taylor, President and CRO. Today, I have two special guests with me, Scott Gilbert, CEO, and Simon Mendoza, CTO. Thank you both for joining. Uh, on this episode of Dare to Innovate, we're going to be talking about shadow IT. So let's dive right in. So Simon, you know, one of the things that uh, we always talk about is what is shadow IT? H how would you define it as, as a, you know, as a CTO and someone that's been in the IT industry for, for decades? Sure. So shadow IT really describes any sort of IT system or solution. So that's software or hardware that's used inside an organization, but without explicit approval or oversight of a central IT function. Uh, and so because it's without that oversight, it's difficult to see and manage. So it lives in the shadows, hence shadow IT. Um, it could be uh, hardware, so a device like a mobile phone or SaaS applications increasingly, um, or even a whole set of infrastructure and, and platform services, which are typically put up to solve some sort of business problem. And the problem is these are often put on like um, corporate credit cards or other ways of purchasing that are not through the regular software purchasing protocols. And so they sort of slip below the radar uh, and they become very difficult to see and, and manage. Uh, and those, some of the, some of the issues really stem from that. So very, very interesting, Simon. So Scott, why, why are we talking about shadow IT? Why did it come about? Well, look, I, you know, I think whoever named shadow IT uh, clearly was a, an IT administrator, uh, someone, and they, they picked a name that made it sound extremely nefarious and dark and, you know, bad. And it's not always a bad thing. You know, shadow IT comes out of necessity. It means someone found a tool, a device, in a lot of cases, that made doing their job easier. And so that entrepreneurial spirit is not always a bad thing. When we talk about it, it is often because something else around the edges is a problem, whether that's a security thing, whether that's a cost thing, whether that's a control around privacy, there's some other thing around the edge, but at its core, Shadow IT is people solving problems, which is something every organization wants. The question is, when it gets too large, when it gets too out of control, what do we do? You know, that, that brings me to kind of my next question or my next thought. Is it a problem or, or what would create it to be a problem? Simon. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hand this one to Simon, but I, I think in my, the short answer I have is it can be a problem. Yeah, for sure. It's not always a problem. Right. Uh, you know, as Scott said, this is a lot about business leaders being empowered to solve their own problems. And in this sort of era where you know, there are more and more cloud services, there's more and more self-service applications, there's more and more low code platforms that enables like the citizen developer. Um, you know, it's it's great that business leaders and business units are able to you know, deliver their own services and solutions to these problems. But where it becomes a problem is where you're bypassing a lot of the organizational controls, which are there for very good reasons. So, you know, on the purchasing side, if you're, you know, buying software, you're, you could potentially be losing out on huge discounts that have been negotiated by your organization with, with the software vendor. Uh, and if you don't know about those corporate contracts or, you know, your bulk purchasing power, you're, you're likely not going to get the benefit of that. And that really leads to, you know, often many instances of, quite large software platforms in some instances like Salesforce. You know, we, we see customers with, with many instances of Salesforce or, you know, other similar big platforms, uh, maybe as a result of M&A, but often as a result of, organ, you know, parts of the organization not talking with each other and buying, um, buying these solutions in isolation. Uh, and so you end up with very fragmented technology and that becomes a problem for, for management and visibility. But another huge area is really around data protection and information security. I mean, I think shadow IT by its nature bypasses a lot of the risk controls that are put in place. So, you know, you might have a, a corporate corporate governance or risk department who will provide guidance on which tools or applications are approved as safe, both from an information security perspective, but also from things like data sovereignty and data protection. Where can you actually physically uh, store this data. You might have contractual commitments with your customers to keep it in a certain region. And if you're using shadow IT 
um, for example, to transfer files with, you know, Dropbox or Gmail or other non-corporate um, enabled and sanctioned services, you could be blowing all of those requirements out of the water and you don't know about it. So that's a, a big risk of shadow IT. Um, yeah, I think the... Go, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I think the piece that I think if, you, if you're to try and, uh, you know, to your question, try and put some very specific bounds around when is it a problem, I think it's a problem when it remains in the shadows for too long, right? If it, if it comes out of the shadows and then starts to get incorporated into those corporate structures that, that Simon just spoke of, then, then shadow IT becomes a good thing. Right, because you went out and found someone found there were you know an, uh, a new solution, you know ingenuity, entrepreneurial spirit. They got it working, maybe, and then they had it incorporated into the larger IT governance that provides all the things that Simon just mentioned around risk, data privacy, residency, all of those aspects. Is there something we've seen in the past in the general IT industry that? is roughly related to this? Or is there an experience that either one of you have had that says, you know, these applications or these services or these things that have been, it, that are in the environment and purchased by different lines of business or procurement that have gone outside of IT? Is there something in our history that looks like this? I'll, I'll let Simon start. I mean, I think, oh, go ahead, yeah, please. Yeah, so, I think if you look at, um, for example, Claro MDSL, we have a long history of managing telecoms and mobility, and there are very strong parallels with this, you know, going back many, many years where, you know, branch offices would purchase their own data lines or phone services. Um, and then, he, and then as mobility became to, you know, became more and more common, they would go down to the, the local store and buy their own mobile phone devices. Um, and sometimes expense them, put them, put them on their own credit cards, put them on corporate credit cards, and you get this explosion of, of technology which is out there. And the organization will pay the expenses in many cases, but there's no oversight, there's no central management, there's no you know, getting of those advantages of, of bulk purchasing or corporate discounts. Um, and then you know, as you move forward, you get a very fragmented estate that requires um, a pretty broad management program to come and rationalize it all together afterwards. So I think if you're putting an expense management program in place, you need to consider not just those services, but how could it expand to cover you know, IT solutions like SaaS, for example. Anything to add there, Scott? Yeah, I think, I think Simon nailed it. I, I think the best comparison is uh, our devices, hardware devices, whether that's laptops, uh, whether that's mobile phones, iPads, you know, the things that, that people would go out and introduce into a corporate environment that didn't come from corporate IT. People, you know, we can go back and, and look at uh, how many articles you can find on USB drives where, you know, someone brought in and, you know, they wanted to, you know, put in their music and listen to their music at work and all of a sudden you have a virus that's spreading across your entire organization. So I think when you look at drawing a comparison, it is going to be at the user level, whether that's a device, whether that's a mobile phone, a USB drive, a floppy disk back in the day, whatever it was. A floppy disk? We're going way back. Uh, you know, I, I've been around, we've been around a while. Simon and I were, I think, talking about this uh, a few weeks ago about some of the, uh, some of the shadow IT things we did when both of us were in university sitting in a computer lab somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've, <laughs> we've obviously talked about, <laughs> you know, and, and defined it a little bit, but, but why is it difficult for an organization to deal with Shido IT or why should they deal with it? Is it, is it visibility? Is it, you know, you know, Simon mentioned maximizing of contracts. Why should an organization deal with it and why is it difficult? Well, I mean, firstly, it's... well, I think it's, I think the, go ahead, go ahead Scott. Go, sorry. All right. Well, I think the, the, the first, and I'll let Simon go, but I think I'll tie back to what we talked about in our last Dare to Innovate session, which is the reason it is difficult is because it is so easy to procure. A user can sign up for services very, very easily. 
you know, a credit card is all they need. And sometimes they don't even need a credit card. They can go out and sign up for a free trial uh, or it could be a freemium service where they're just leveraging the non-paid portions of it. So I think the, the, real, the real basis of why it is difficult is because it is so easy to consume. So Simon, a lot of these organizations have very well-oiled procurement organizations that things go through. Is should you know should that organization be stepping up and taking care of it? Well, I think um, those organizations need to be empowered with the right processes, with the right tools, to really embrace you know some of the advantages of of what you know we're describing as shadow IT, but it's really not just shadow IT, it's business-led IT, decentralized IT. There are a few different words for, you know, the good side of this, as, as Scott was mentioning before. And I think um, as long as there are good processes put in place to review and um, approve new services and get those new services into the hands of users quickly, then procurement and IT can be enablers of this. They can really help um, move the business forward, embrace the latest technology and procurement organizations. Yes, they need to, they need to modernize. They need to have the tools and processes though, to be able to manage it, uh, through the full life cycle, all the way from sourcing reviews and that sort of a technical review and a risk review all the way through, through the life cycle of actually running it and then decommissioning it. I think, you know, as Scott said, some of this is at the user level where uh, and we've seen this on mobility as well. If a user leaves an organization, what are you going to do with all the services that um, the organization was paying for on their behalf? So on mobility, if you've got a mobility expense management program in place, you know, that's taken care of. But what about your software licenses? What about, um, you know, other hardware that you might have? What about the infrastructure that supports that? Um, these organizations are going to need to take all of that into account in the programs that they run to manage it. So, you know, Scott, we, we've we've gotten to a point in which, you know, what can an organization do to take control of it? You know, Simon talked about some tools, some processes that need to be put in place. But what should an organization go do to take control of shadow IT without limiting the business's capabilities to, you know, to solve problems? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, and, and we'll... At least from my perspective, it really goes back to uh, a little bit of the core tenets of an expense management program, which is around, you know, discovery and visibility, control, and then optimization. And those things need to come at the appropriate time. The first one is the visibility, just understanding that it exists. So, you know, as we talk about things like discovery through SSO platforms, whether it's Okta or Azure AD, and really understanding what tools are out there being leveraged, just be aware of them. And then to Simon's point, the next one is around control and understanding the scope of the platform and determining, do we have control risks? Do we have control problems? And, and tackling it from from that as the second piece. And then the third one really goes back to that Salesforce uh, comment Simon made earlier. And, you know, I was having a conversation with a, a consultant that we talked about this last time that had, they found seven different Salesforce contracts existed at the company because it was bought by different departments. And so that third step of optimization is then saying, hey, wait a minute, we can leverage our buying now and get a better rate because we're buying at a much larger scale than each individual department thought they were buying at. So I think if you, you break it down logically like that, that's the best way to control it, which is first discover and have visibility into it, then put the appropriate controls around it, whether that's around purchasing or deprovisioning, as Simon just mentioned, and then talk about is there an optimization opportunity here? Yeah, I'd agree. I think there are certainly lots of tools uh, available on the market that will help discover and provide some more visibility into, you know, the IT services that are out there that are not well understood by centralized IT departments. As, as Scott mentioned, SSO platforms are one. Um, but obviously, if, if your application is on an SSO platform, then it must have been registered at some point. So it's not as shadowy as some shadow IT. Um, but you can go deeper. You can look at firewall logs. 
you can look at the expense reports um, from your corporate credit cards. You can put agents on devices. Um, you can do all sorts of things, but it does tend to be quite labor intensive to go and discover applications in that way. I think, you know, if you think about it as business led or decentralized IT, what you have to do is take the organization with you and really almost provide a bit of an amnesty to say to business leaders, hey, look, we know that you're using these tools out there. Come and tell us what you're using and tell us why and allow us to identify how to bring those things into compliance. You know, we'll do the reviews, we'll manage them with you, um, or we'll offer an alternative. Um, and in that way, you get hopefully the best of all worlds. You get you know, those ideas coming from back from the business about what tools are actually needed, but you get some sort of, uh, you get some control over it as well from both a risk and a, and a cost perspective. Simon, I feel that that may be a little shot at me for, uh, I like business led IT better than <laughs> shadow IT. I'm just, I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, so do I get an amnesty for everything that I have? Well, it's it only goes so far. Yeah, don't so far. trust him. Don't trust him. Andrew. I know he's saying it, but don't trust him. <laughs> um, as, as we digress a little bit, but you know, we, we've talked about a, a lot here. What is it? you know, how do we solve it? You know, why is there a problem? But what are the consequences for not addressing this? What, what are, what is an organization going to feel in terms of pain that would say, um, I'm going to gain something by going out there and developing a process, developing, you know, a, a center to go drive this, whether it's in procurement or IT or another organization, what are the consequences of doing nothing? Um, Simon. I think that the classic answer, if you like, is around the security and risk side. If you don't know what's out there and being used, you run a huge risk as an organization of your user base, um, not necessarily deliberately, but actively potentially sending your data, your organization's data outside of the bounds that you would consider to be safe and approved. Uh, so that's to applications which um, perhaps don't have the, the appropriate security controls around them to regions of the world where you are, you know, in breach of your uh, obligations to your customers to keep data within certain regions. And in doing so, you are running the risk of things like data loss and security breaches. And, and we know the sort of impact on a company's image and reputation um, that those sorts of events have. But I think beyond that, that sort of uh, risk that is put by the data protection side of things, there's a huge organizational risk around the amount of waste that goes into shadow IT, not taking advantage of the opportunities to manage it properly and get the benefits of having business led or decentralized IT um, to say, these are the, this is, these are the services that we, we want to use. Um, and having the right level of control over them so that you're mitigating um, the risks around it while really exploiting all of the benefits. So, we, Scott, we dove into a little bit, and uh, as, si as I would expect out of Simon, he went to the fear side of, of what could happen. What's the benefit side to an organization, or what, what are the consequences that Simon talked a little bit about in not addressing this if you know, from an optimization perspective, what are other benefits that are out there besides, you know, the potential, you know, tremendous negative impact, whether it be damage, the, you know, data loss, uh, potential security breaches, things like that. Yeah, I think, you know, look, the shadow IT will uh, continue to get a bad rap uh, when you talk about it on a uh, global level because the stories uh, will always be the big ones that come out, right? It'll be the, hey, this company didn't realize they had this tool in place, that, that tool got hacked and there was a massive, uh, massive amount of consumer data leaked into the, the black market. So those big things will always be what generates the most press, uh, negative press around it. But as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, the, the reason that shadow IT exists is because someone in an organization is trying to solve a problem and for better or worse, they believe they found a way to do that with this IT tool, whether that's software, hardware, whatever it is. And I think the benefit to getting control over it, putting a program in place 
is that that can then be shared across the rest of the organization. There is a great chance that someone else in some other department had the same sort of need, the same sort of problem, and has been struggling with the solution. So if you get that visibility, control, and an optimization, you can potentially leverage that across a much larger part of the organization to drive whatever it is they were solving, an efficiency, uh, effectiveness, what, whatever it was that they solved, now you can, you can share that across a much larger organization. Scott and Simon, thank you guys so much for joining today and taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, it was a great conversation, and we'll see you next time on Dare to Innovate. Stay on top of the conversation. Like and subscribe to our channel to get notified when our newest episodes release. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Dare to Innovate.